Father Hugh Gilbert, our abbot, was born on the 15th of March, 1911. <laughs> 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 Father Abbot told me not to give his age, so I give only his date. <laughs> I give only his date of birth. He was born in Emsworth, near Portsmouth. I had to look that on the map. <laughs> he did his studies in London, first at St. Paul's School, then King's College, where he was awarded a first-class degree in history. He entered the monastery at the age of 22 and was thereafter Father Anselm's, you saw him last night, yeah. Father Anselm's monastic twin. The <laughs> They share their dates of clothing, simple and solemn profession and ordination. He succeeded Father Morris as novice master in 1986, and my principal source says that he was the first novice to be brought up, yeah, my source, on Newman rather than the Legion of Mary handbook. <laughs> <laughs> After a brief period as prior, he was elected to succeed Abbot Alfred Alfred Spencer as Abbot on the 29th of October 1992. He received national recognition uh, uh, as a, at least a contender for the highest oh ecclesiastical <laughs> <laughs> positions in these islands. And he's also the author of two books and many other works besides. And he's giving us our keynote address and the other speakers will try to speak in similar keys. <laughs> is an example of that. Uh, it isn't a keynote address at all. Uh, it's just to share a few thoughts on, 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 on a, a topic which I hope will be of interest and use to you. So, to begin. Well, yes, I, I'm not going to talk about being an oblate directly, because one becomes an oblate as one becomes a monk in the hope, possibly the vain hope, of being a better Christian. And so it's more just one aspect, some aspects, of what it is to be a Christian. Now, perhaps we should just think on the word. They were first called Christians in Antioch. And we're called such, of course, after Christ. And as we know, the word Christ means anointed one. You are the Christ, says Peter, at a great moment. But our Lord was anointed by the Spirit. You remember that key uh, thing in the Gospel of Luke, key scene where he appears in the synagogue at Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. So it's our privilege as Christians to share the name of Christ. And if we share his name, that means we share his mission. This mission, it's, it's often said, and it was said frequently by uh, the Second Vatican Council and by John Paul II, is, was for Christ and is for us a threefold mission as prophet, priest, and king. Now, a quotation here from John Paul II. After he was uh, elected Pope, he gave a series of interviews to a French journalist, André Fossard. And in the course of the interview, he said this. Now, th it's, it's a rather sort of John Paul II sentence. <coughs> Not perhaps 
political thought and seeking. Um, after reflecting on the whole of its content, the content of Vatican II, I have come to the conclusion that according to Vatican II, to believe, to believe, first thing, is to enter the mission of the church by agreeing to participate in the triple ministry of Christ as prophet, priest, and king. So that, that's a slightly heavy sentence. But this I I is, if you like, the fruit of his mature reflection on the teaching of the council. That to believe, which is the first thing, to be a believer. What does that mean? It means to enter the mission of the church by agreeing to participate in the triple ministry of Christ as prophet, priest, and king. That's, I think, uh, uh, a good statement. And that's, in a way, what I would like to unpack. Now, just a little footnote here. That we're talking about a participation common to the whole church, to Christ faithful, to every member of the church, deriving from faith and the sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist. Deacons, priests, and bishops, by virtue of ordination, share in a, a further way, if you like, in Christ's threefold office. But I'm not concerned with this, but with what belongs to all of us as Christians. Uh, <coughs> male or female, slave or free, Greek or, or barbarian whatever we may be, uh, and, uh, and holds especially, of course, in a special way for the laity, who uh, Newman famously said, well, the church would look rather silly without them. <laughs> um, so, uh, <coughs> so it's that. And this, uh, uh, this explains this, um, <coughs> if you could remove the map, please, please. Um, that, that, uh, <coughs> What I have done is bring in uh, one of the oil stocks, if you call it, the one which has chrism in it. Chrism. Uh, and now chrism is used in the sacraments, and it is used, that the first use of it is in the post-baptismal anointing. If uh, uh, either a child, an infant, uh, or an adult is to be is being baptized and not being confirmed immediately, not receiving the blessing of the sacrament immediately, then they are anointed with chrism on the crown of the head. The crown of the head. <coughs> and the church teaches, the liturgy teaches, that our participation in the threefold mission of Christ, the prophet, priest, and king, is rooted in that action, in that liturgical action. So, when uh, the minister anoints the child or the adult with chrism, which is the holiest of the oils, which is consecrated, not just blessed, but consecrated by a bishop on Maundy Thursday as the equivalent. Uh, when the priest anoints, he says this, he declares this, the God of power and father of our Lord Jesus Christ has freed you from sin and brought you to new life through water and the Holy Spirit. That's the baptism which has just taken place. He now anoints you with the chrism of salvation so that united with his people you may remain forever a member of Christ who is priest, prophet and king. 